Hey, my dear friends, Sam Haymart with Test Driven TV. Today we are test driving, finally, the all new 2022 Ford Maverick Hybrid. And this is a Base XL, the truck from the headlines. $19,995, 42 miles to the gallon. So we're gonna have a look inside and out. We're gonna take it for a drive and see if it really lives up to all the hype. Before we get out on the test drive, let's talk about what we've got. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, this is a base grade XL hybrid. And by that, I mean it's $19,995 plus one single option of the trailer hitch receiver for hundred bucks, gives us an as tested price of $21,590 with the destination fee. And so except for that $100 hitch, this is as cheap as it gets. So let's really have a look at what that gets you. Right up front, standard, LED headlights. There's a lot of vehicles out there that cost a lot more than that that don't have LED headlights. LED daytime running lights. Now there is a more expensive headlight that you're going to get on the top grades uh, that has a nice signature lighting package, but this does have basic LED DRLs. Looking down at the grill and the bumper, black plastic, very plain, as you might expect on a base work truck. And there's some holes down in the lower bumper that appear that they might be great for some fog lights, but those are not yet available as an option. And on the FX4 EcoBoost models, tow hooks will be poking out through those as well. Coming around the corner, base wheels on this 17 inch sparkle silver steel wheels with Continental Pro Contact tires, 225, 65, 17 size. That's a pretty substantial tire and wheel package for a base truck, even if we're a midsize. So uh, they didn't cheap out too badly here. XL emblem on the fender, black plastic, and look at the mirrors here. Black plastic, of course, they're not chrome, they're not body color, but they are manual, right? They're not power, and I don't mean manual like you reach over and you, you pull a little lever on the inside of your truck. They're manual like you roll down the window and you put your hand out there and you adjust them. Coming down the side, black plastic cladding underneath the doors and up on top of the cab is a small antenna. Now that is one area where I've seen a little bit of discussion out there on the forums. People not real happy with that. I'm not sure I am either. It's in the way. If you're going to put any kind of rack and uh, you know accessories up on top of this truck that reach over the top of the cab, it's in the way. And there are ways around that, but that is a little bit of a curious feature that Ford has done there. Coming around the back, a few things we want to talk about is the fuel door to start out with. On the hybrid, this is actually a remote release, unlike the EcoBoost model. And that's because there's some technical issues having to do with emissions and the control for the vapors on the hybrid model. So you have to press a button inside and sometimes there's a short time delay, but that effectively makes this a locking fuel door on the hybrid model. Kind of a nice little bonus. On top of the cargo box is plastic cladding all the way around. And something I always like to point out with the Maverick to people that maybe it's their first time you've looked at it, because this is a unibody pickup truck, the cargo box is not separated from the cab like most conventional pickup trucks. So Ford had a little bit of an engineering challenge here when it comes to body flex. So what they've done is they've actually hung this quarter panel on the vehicle as a floating panel, just like a front fender. So you can see there's a seam right here. And if you open the door, you can see that it is in fact a separate panel and it's bolted on. That's actually a good thing if you ever get into an accident or something like that. This is a replaceable panel that's easily replaced. Plastic cladding wraps around the back and becomes the rear bumper. This one, as I mentioned at the outset, has the trailer hitch option for an extra hundred bucks. Pretty good deal on that. This particular trailer hitch comes with a four pin connector. If you get the 4K tow package on the EcoBoost model, that comes with a seven pin connector. Looking up at the tailgate, you can see the Maverick is stamped into it quite nicely and there is the hybrid badge on this one. Looking up at the Ford emblem there, there's also the camera mounted sort of hidden underneath the bottom of this. All Ford Mavericks have a locking tailgate on them and that's a nice thing so they don't disappear on you. But on the XL model, that is a manually locking tailgate you have to use the key whereas on the xlt and above you can use that with the power locks it just locks with everything else opening it up one thing of note it does not have the soft open like a lot of trucks have now but one cool feature is the fact that you can disconnect these cables and hook them up higher and that allows you to put four by eight sheets of material in here and there's a lot of information out there on the ford website about that you can lay a two by six across the fender wells and with this this can hold quite a bit of weight 
plywood, sheetrock, whatever you need to carry in 4x8 sheets. And looking around in the cargo box, you can see that there are four hooks on this one, actually six if you count the ones down here on the tailgate. This does not have a bed liner in it, very plain. Doesn't have the cubbies either that you see on the XLT and above. This has blank plates on both sides at the back there with a the little QR code for the flex bed features that you can do yourself. One very cool thing is this does have a 12 volt power source back here. You can just pop this little cover off and that's on both sides. So if you have accessories you want to put in here, like a plug, charging ports, LED lights, whatever that might be. And that is a switch source and that is a fused source. The interior of the Ford Maverick XL hybrid in this case is pretty basic. Now, one thing to point out is that no matter which Ford Maverick you get, you get a blue interior. That's just the way it is, at least for 2022. The difference becomes in the trim grades, different seat fabrics, different accent colors and trim colors, but the background color is always navy pier. So I hope you like blue. I happen to like this color combination in the XL. I've got blacks and grays in the plastic trim and the navy pier in the backdrop. This is all hard plastic everywhere you look, on the dash, on the door panels, down on the console. The only soft materials in here are on this console lid and the trims on the door panels, the armrests. Other than that, they've kept this very basic. It's built to a price. That's how they get it down to that $19,995 starting price. When it comes to feature content, we're pretty basic here. A lot of conversation out there as I look at the steering wheel is about the fact this does not have cruise control in the XL. Um, and so the steering wheel is a little bit more basic in that way. There are controls on the steering wheel for the radio and for the instrument cluster, some of the settings. This is a urethane steering wheel, not leather covered. Looking ahead at the instrument cluster, this is sort of a parts bin Ford corporate instrument cluster, nothing fancy. There is a digital center screen, but it's a pretty small one. And you can configure that to whatever you want to look at, be it your trip information or what's on your audio system and so forth. The hybrid instrument cluster has a power meter on the left side, which doesn't really have a lot of detailed information. It's just zero to 100 power and then charge. And then on the right, a speedometer. The center stack, uh, very basic here, very small audio and interface here at eight inches. There's a little storage cubby off to the side of it, which has been talked about quite a bit. And there's also another storage cubby up on the top of the dash. Controls for that right below. This does have climate control. It's a manual climate control, but it is one step up from the three dials that you would probably expect in a vehicle like this. It's actually a, a bit of a surprise to be able to just set a temperature and put it on auto. So it's a very basic climate control. Vents there in the center and looking down at the lower center console, a pretty good amount of versatility down here. There's a nice little slot to put your phone and in higher end models, there's a wireless phone charger down there in that area. There's a 12 volt port, two USB ports, two different types. Down in the middle, cup holders off to the right and the gear selector here is a knob, not my favorite. I always prefer a lever, but the parking brake is electric. It's right behind that. And behind that are buttons, which are for the drive mode, traction control, and the auto brake hold. A little bit more storage. Inside here, a little bit more than a square tissue box worth of storage. It's like a tissue box and in half, I'd say, but it's nice and deep, plenty of storage there. These seats are covered in a black onyx cloth is what Ford calls it. It's actually a black and a gray two-tone arrangement. It's a pretty sturdy looking cloth. It has a bit of a sort of a backpack material kind of feel to it that sort of gives me the impression they might last a while. They are manually adjustable, front and rear, recline and height. Now, the thing about the height that I have to point out is they don't adjust up and down like this. They adjust up and down like this. The front sort of has a hinge point. So if you're really sensitive to how high the front of your seat is, you might have a seat in this truck before you buy one, if that's a really big issue for you. Uh, it is kind of for me, and it took me a while uh, to get a happy place with these seats, and I still wish I could lower the front of the seat down just a little bit. There are standard floor mats in the front only. There aren't any in the back standard. Uh, if you want more, you're gonna have to option those, and they do have lots of options on the Ford website. Rear seat comfort with a Maverick is actually better than expected given its compact truck size. I find it's really right on par with the Ranger, almost identical, and um, actually better than a Toyota Tacoma, which is the midsize class. 
The one thing I would point out is that this is a very firm seat. It feels very flat. Uh, not the most comfortable seat in the world. And as you can see, my knees are perched up just a tad bit. So the seating position is pretty low. But again, better than expected for the size of this vehicle. When it comes to legroom, these seats are set for my height. Five foot nine with my boots on right now. I've got a couple of inches ahead of me. So that is not so bad. I don't feel like I'm scrunched in here in headroom. Um, I'm doing pretty good. I could have my hat on in here right now. And um, I'd be doing just fine. Now, when it comes to amenities, not a lot going on back here. There is a 12 volt port on the back of the console and a fits slot. That is the Ford integrated tether system where they offer accessories that can slide into this slot like cup holders, a trash can, uh, anything that you can think of and you could even print uh, with a 3D printer as they like to tell us, but there's no vents. That's the big thing that I'm seeing missing there. There are no vents and it's not just because we're in the XL. Uh, you can't get that on any Maverick, and that is a pretty big omission in my opinion. The Santa Cruz does offer that, and I know some of you who watch my videos always complain at me when I say this, that, oh, oh, well, Sam, there's there's vents under the seats. Um, no, okay? That that doesn't work when it's 110 degrees and the air conditioning is blowing on your shoes, okay? That's, that's not vents in the back. That's maybe for heating, but I'm talking about vents that blow on your face when it's really hot and you get in the vehicle, so it's missing that. That's just the bottom line. Now, the seat does fold up. You can get under there and there's storage. There is a little bit of an area blocked out on the hybrid, as you can see, for the battery. The 12 volt battery actually resides under the seat, which powers all of the accessories, the lighting, the computer, and things like that. The actual hybrid high voltage battery sits underneath the floor on the passenger side. The seat back does fold forward so that you can access the jack and a few other little things that they have stowed back there. Uh, you could use it as storage, but it's not necessarily a storage area per se. When it comes to rating this interior, I look at a number of things. Uh, yes, it does have a lot of hard plastic in here. It is built to a price. No question about that. It does have a lot of versatility, but uh, I did have a few issues with things like the controls. Not real jazzed about this twist knob and not real jazzed about uh, the lack of adjustment on these seats. So this interior comes in at four out of five stars. Now we have to talk about this audio and human interface. Now, this is a radio, a very basic radio, AM, FM radio. It just happens to be what we call display audio, right? Um, it's more basic than you're going to find in any Ford out there. Most Ford come standard with Sync 3. This is not that. Okay, this is a radio, and so let's get the bad news out of the way. The audio quality, if you've read and you've been out there studying, you've probably heard a lot of people say it's junk. Um, it's junk, okay? This is, a, this is like clock radio type stuff, all right? It's got multiple speakers in here, but the, the audio quality is just not that good, okay? Calling it an audio system isn't really, isn't really right. It's a radio, like, as I mentioned, a clock radio. There's a clock and it's a radio. And I'm being funny about it, but it's good enough for a base cheap vehicle, but it's the same radio you get all the way up until you get into the Lariat with some packaging that gets you the Sync 3 and the, and the Beats audio. So it's, it's pretty surprising that they didn't do a little better than this. It is an eight inch screen. It does have a number of features worth pointing out. Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, they are plug in though. And it does have a backup camera that, again, that's an area where a lot of people out there have been complaining about it. I find that it's okay. It does have lines that turn with you when you're backing up, and that's more than some vehicles do offer. Now, using it, that's where the rubber hits the road here, where it becomes a clock radio again. The menu's very nice to look at. It looks like Sync 3. It's very attractive. It gets dark at night, and it's easy to see. And the menus are actually very simple and easy to understand. The problem is, is that it's jinky, uh, especially if you're using Bluetooth. Like, I have Bluetooth audio that I use in this because it doesn't have satellite radio. And so I can stream satellite SXM through my phone. I can stream Pandora. I can stream whatever streaming music service that I have. But it doesn't always connect up like it's supposed to. Sometimes you have to restart it, turn it off. Um, it's jinky. It just doesn't always work as you'd expect. It's not seamless. Sometimes you have to restart your music. Sometimes you don't. This has this other thing called Smart Device Link, which allows you to actually have your apps up on the screen and control them. Pandora will show up there. Sirius XM will show up in your sources. You can hit it and you've got full suite control that you'd have on your phone, but it doesn't always work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Most of the time it doesn't. So I just have to go right to my phone and then stream manually, which is fine, 
but it's just very interesting how sometimes this expanded suite of features works and sometimes it doesn't. It's jinky. So when I combine the quality of the sound here with uh, the menu just being slow and not really kind of with it, this is a clock radio and it gets two and a half out of five stars. All right, my friends, now it's time to take a drive. And so the first question I always like to ask is how does it go? Power's linear, it just goes, and 60. So, a little different than most cars and how it sounds and how it feels, this is a hybrid, right? It has a 2.5 liter gasoline engine and a transmission that's got two electric motors in it. One is a main traction motor, the other one is mostly a generator. And together, this has 191 horsepower, gas and electric, and the total published torque is 155, and that's the number on the engine. Now, the electric motor has its own torque number, but uh, there comes at no time those things work together to exceed the 155, which is why that is the number that's published. It's an electric, continuously variable transmission in ECVT. An ECVT, not to be confused with a CVT. Completely different thing. So if you've driven cars with a CVT and absolutely hated them, know that this is nothing like that. It's, it doesn't even, they're not even related mechanically, how they work, how they feel and so forth. So um, if the word CVT immediately made you go, ah, stop that, okay? Because it's, a, it's not the same thing. They're different animals. We have a complete video explaining all that, how it works, how it functions, and why it's not the same, link down below. So that out of the way, um, the power is actually pretty decent. It's not fast, right? If you want fast, you buy the EcoBoost. That's 250 horsepower turbo gasoline engine, and that'll handle your power needs. This is actually what I would call adequate, and around town and in traffic, it's plenty. I, I've never once this week said, oh, this feels gutless. Hmm, disappointing. No, it's got plenty of torque off the line. It's got plenty of torque when you mash the pedal to pass things like that and um, you know you can get out of other people's way just fine and it just feels like it's got good power now this does have drive modes it defaults to normal there's eco mode which makes it feel a lot slower and then there's sport which makes it feel a lot faster none of these drive modes actually change the amount of power that's output they actually change the way it feels right so it changes the throttle response when it's on sport and you mash the power pedal you get the power faster when it's on eco it tends not to respond as quickly now there is a difference when it comes to regenerative braking when it's on eco and normal the regenerative braking is much stronger strongest on eco so if you set it to eco you're actually going to potentially get more range out of your battery because when you let off the power pedal you feel that regenerative braking a lot stronger and it works a lot stronger when you're driving around town that said, it always defaults to normal. Even if you have it set on eco, it goes back to normal every time you shut the vehicle off and restart it. That's kind of a curiosity. Most drive modes, uh, if you put them on sport, it always goes back to normal when you restart the car. It's just the way it's been. But eco, with most cars, it always stays there because that's better. Now efficiency, that's what everybody wants to know. How does it do? Well, it's rated at 42 city, 33 highway, and 37 MPG combined. Now. City's higher because that's what hybrids do. Highway's lower because the gas engine's running most of the time in the city. Uh, you have a lot more electric power filling the void. Now, in my week with it, my first tank of gas, 100% city driving, not a mile of freeway, I got 44 MPG and that was measured at the pump. It said 48 on the dash. I have a complete video, also linked down below and on our playlist at the end. Uh, going over that whole mileage scenario, but my city mileage, my actual was 44 for the week. And since then, I have seen about a 36 to 37 MPG average for combined. So it's right in the neighborhood for what it promises for combined fuel economy. Sometimes at slow speeds, this transmission and drivetrain does take getting used to it. You can feel the transition between the gasoline engine and the electric from time to time. Now there is really no indicator here that tells you I'm on EV mode or not. Sometimes it says all electric when you start the vehicle up, but 
that it's kind of ambiguous, but the power meter here is actually very helpful. There's a braking coach that helps you learn how to utilize the brake pedal in a way that gives you maximum regenerative braking, which is actually very helpful. And we're probably gonna do another video on that down the road, explaining that in more detail, but it is a helpful feature that I like. So when it comes to rating this powertrain, it gets four out of five stars. Now on the topic of ride and handling, it's a truck, okay? And what does that mean? Well, it means it's got a pretty firm ride. And this is a chassis that's not, you know, it's not a BMW, right? It sells for $19,995. But it's got a few things that do make it different from most passenger cars. And I just came to a stop. And one of those things is, is that the brakes take a little bit of practice to get used to because this is utilizing two forms of braking, regenerative braking through the transmission and the regular braking system. And so it's got a computer control that takes your inputs on the pedal and decides where to send that braking power. And at slower speeds, particularly in parking lots and things like that, it just takes getting used to. And that's really just the bottom line. It works differently, it feels different, and sometimes it can, it can be abrupt. So there's that. The ride itself has a nice firm feel. It's a quality feel. This structure is actually very stiff. Very impressed with that. The ride on the highway is quiet. Wind noise isn't too bad. The 70 mile an hour average that I do, 63.2 decibels, which is right in line with the FX4 XLT EcoBoost Maverick that I tested last month. And so it's, it's about the same, even though the tires are different. One thing I have noticed a little bit is that the steering feel is a little bit on the numb side. It doesn't have a lot of feel to it. It tends to be a little bit slow and, and numb when it comes to the actual feel. Going over speed humps and speed bumps in my neighborhood, road imperfections, manhole covers, I find that it's, it feels pretty refined and solid, but I'm really curious to see how it does off the pavement. On the desert gravel road, this is a place where I can really sort of feel any rattling or instability or lack of solidity this chassis might have. And it's very quiet. I'm not getting any rattling in the suspension or in the steering or in the interior components. I'm very impressed for the most part. This chassis gets four and a half out of five stars. Now it's time to talk about value. And I think that's really where Ford has hit it out of the park with the Ford Maverick. Starting price at 19,995 standard hybrid. You cannot touch that anywhere, anywhere. The next closest pickup is the Hyundai Santa Cruz, which is a great truck, but it's $4,000 more across the board. The next closest hybrid is a Toyota Corolla hybrid. That's 23.6 plus destination. You're about 25 as tested here. Uh, we're at 21,590. So, um, at least in the base grades, the Ford Maverick is a phenomenal value. I would call it the value of the century. And yes, it's not top of class in a lot of the areas that we talked about, particularly uh, the cheaper interior and some of the features that it doesn't have. But darn, you know, that, that's where you go for this price. But it's available at this price. Even if you look out there in the market for other vehicles that are just $20,000, there aren't very many out there. You can go into some smaller sedans like a Nissan Versa or, you know, get into that kind of category. But when you look at small SUVs, the closest thing you can go with here is like a Nissan Kicks. That's a little bit under $20,000, but it's, it's a lot less substantial a vehicle. Chevrolet Trax, Chevrolet Trailblazer, are a little bit more than this, but right in the same neighborhood. There's just not a lot if you wanna spend $20,000 on a new vehicle that you have an option for that has this kind of utility. And that's really where I think Ford has nailed it by, by strategy, uh, getting the price where it's at. Yes, it's plain. Yes, it's kind of downgrade in terms of what we see in the norm out there, but there's a market for it. I really believe that. And so the only reason this does not come in at a full five-star value is because of warranty. 336 bumper to bumper, 560. Uh, for powertrain and eight years, 100,000 miles for anything hybrid related, that being the battery, the power system, the control systems. Um, that's very good. However, Hyundai beats it at 10 years, 100,000 miles for the powertrain and then 560 for everything else. So a very good value. I put that at four and a half out of five stars. When you put that in with everything we've already talked about, we're four out of five stars for the review. Very good. 
still and it makes my buy it list now we've tested this vehicle a couple times before it's been on the buy it list since last june because it actually is on the i bought it list this is my truck actually uh we just took delivery about a week ago and uh, so this is the drive review on the truck we're going to be doing a lot of content on this what's it like to live with reliability anything that comes up and a lot of spot videos on some of the things about the truck that uh, we learn as we go along so if you want to keep up to breast on that or keep abreast, keep up to or keep abreast, you can click right there and you can see the full playlist on the Ford Maverick, all of our content on that, or just simply subscribe to our YouTube channel right down there. Either way, stay tuned.